Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're really getting into the weeds of generative AI for structural biology. That's right. We're going head to head, comparing DeepMind's AlphaFold Multimer with the open source project, OpenFold. Yeah, and our mission here is to give you the full picture, not just the high level scores, but really the nitty gritty technical stuff. Exactly. We'll unpack the architectures, the training, the math involved, and you know what this all means from a business perspective too. It's worth remembering, I think, that the original AlphaFold 2 absolutely nailed single protein chains monomers. That was huge. Oh, definitely. Near atomic accuracy. But biology is messy. It's about interactions. Right. Predicting how multiple protein chains multimers actually fit together, especially at the interface where they connect, that was the next big hurdle. And that's precisely what AlphaFold Multimer, or AFM, was built for taking those multiple chains and focusing hard on getting that interaction surface, that interface, correct. Okay, so let's quantify that. How much better is AFM? What are we even measuring when we talk about docking accuracy? Good question. The go-to metric is the dock Q score. Think of it like a quality score for how well the predicted geometry matches reality right at that interface. And there are levels to this, right? Like what's considered good? Yeah, generally a docu score over 0.49 is seen as medium accuracy. Get above 0.8 and that's high accuracy. Pretty tough standard. So how did AFM stack up on say a standard test set? I remember seeing a benchmark with 17 heterodimers. Yeah, two different chains interacting. On that set, AFM hit medium accuracy on 14 out of 17. That's pretty solid. And high accuracy. Six out of the 17. Yeah. But the really telling number is the average docu score across the whole set. Okay, what was that jump? Well, the prior state of the art, which was like AlphaFold refined by another system called Clus Pro, averaged about 0.49. So medium accuracy on average. Right. AFM pushed that average up to 0.65. That jump, 0.16 points, is actually really significant in structural biology. It means much more reliable interface predictions overall. That kind of improvement suggests they did more than just feed it more data. They must have tweaked the core model, the learning process itself. Oh, absolutely. Some key architectural changes. One of the most interesting was the loss function modification. Ah, the FAPE loss, frame aligned point error. I remember that from AlphaFold 2. It measures geometric errors. Yeah. But it was clamped, right? Capped at 10 angstroms. Exactly. For a single chain, that makes sense. If a part of your prediction is more than 10 A off, it's just wrong. Clamping stops that huge error from creating a crazy gradient signal. But for two separate chains trying to find each other, 10 angstroms is nothing. They could start miles apart in the prediction. Precisely. If the model predicts two chains are, say, 50 A apart when they should be touching, that 10A clamp means the loss signal is identical whether the error is 10A or 50A. So the model gets no useful feedback to make big corrections. It can't learn to pull those distant chains together effectively. You got it. The gradient signal just dies. Yeah. So for AFM, DeepMind made a clever change. They unclamped the FATE loss, but only for pairs of residues on different chains, the interchain pairs. Ah, so it keeps the clamp for residues within the same chain to maintain local structure quality. Right, keeps that stable. But unleashes the gradient for the interface. Exactly. It provides that strong, long-range signal needed to guide incorrect interfaces towards the right configuration, even if they start far apart. Targeted aggression, as you said earlier. Makes sense. What else? They added some extra position information too, didn't they? To help the model know which chain is which. Yes, extra positional encodings, basically flags to tell the model if two amino acids are on different chains, and even if those different chains are identical copies, homomers, or distinct types, heteromers. Which brings us to the symmetry problem. This sounds mathematically tricky. Like if you have three identical chains, A, B, and C. Oh wait, they're identical, so let's call them A1, A2, A3. Right. And the model predicts the correct structure, but maybe it labels the chain that should be A1 is A2 and A2 is A3 and A3 is A1. So structurally perfect, but the labels are shuffled. If you just compare coordinates directly to the ground truth, boom, huge penalty. Totally only tanks the score. Yeah. yeah. Even though the biology is right. So they needed a way to handle this permutation sure. symmetry. Well, they solved it. They implemented what's called a greedy heuristic for multi-chain permutation alignment. During scoring, it quickly checks all possible ways to assign the labels, A1, A2, A3, to the predicted chains. And picks the best one. It picks the permutation that gives the lowest RMSD, the lowest geometric error, compared to the ground truth. So it finds a label assignment that makes the prediction look best, ensuring penalties are for actual structural errors, not just labeling mix-ups. Very clever. Okay, one last bit on AFM tech, confidence scores. If the interface is the goal, 
the old PLDDT score isn't quite enough, is it? Correct. PLDDT tells you about the confidence in the local structure of each residue, which is still useful. But for multifamers, they introduced IPTM, which stands for Interface PTM. Focus just on the interface. Exactly. It specifically measures the confidence in the predicted interactions between residues on different chains. So how do they combine these? The final confidence score they report is weighted. It's 80% based on that crucial IPTM score and 20% on the overall PTM score. Gives you a better sense whether the interaction is likely correct. Okay, so AFM, highly tuned, specific solutions for interfaces, proven results with that 0.65 DOCQ benchmark. That's the proprietary standard. Yep. Now let's pivot to the challenger, OpenFold. Which isn't just one company's product, it's more like an ecosystem. That's a great way to put it. It's run by a nonprofit consortium, the Open Molecular Software Foundation. Their whole mission is developing free open source tools for biology and drug discovery. Think democratization. And technically, it started as a re-implementation of Elfful 2, right? Pretty much. They describe it as a trainable PyTorch re-implementation. They aimed for, and largely achieved, practical equivalence in inference results to the original Alphafold 2. But the key difference isn't just the code, it's the platform and the license. Absolutely critical differences. Alphafold used JAX and TensorFlow. OpenFold is built entirely on PyTorch. Which is huge in the academic world and for many companies. Huh? Dominant, really. And this means OpenFold could release the entire stack training code, inference code, even the data sets they processed under a permissive license, Apache 2.0, I believe. Meaning companies can take it, modify it, use it for a commercial drug discovery without the kind of restrictions you might get with proprietary content. Exactly. It opens the door for widespread adoption, modification, and innovation, especially in labs or startups that couldn't afford or navigate complex licenses. But how does a nonprofit consortium compete with, say, DeepMind's resources? Collaboration is key. They've built a powerful consortium. Mm -hmm. We're talking major players. Six global pharma companies, Johnson & Johnson, Novo Nordisk, tech giants like NVIDIA chipping in hardware and expertise. So it's like crowdsourced R&D at a massive scale. In a way, yes. This collective approach allows them to tackle ambitious projects and maybe even move faster in some areas. And they're not just replicating AlphaFold, they're building extensions. Definitely. They're working on their own OpenFold Multimer, naturally, but also things like OpenFold Solosig. Solosig, single sequence. Does that mean getting rid of the need for MSAs? Multiple sequence alignment? That's the goal. MSAs are powerful, but computationally expensive and sometimes hard to generate. Predicting structure from just a single protein sequence would be a huge leap in speed and applicability. Wow. And what else? The big one for pharma. Open-fold small molecule again. Predicting how potential drug molecules bind to proteins. That's, you know, the core of structure-based drug design. That's incredibly ambitious. But trading these things, especially at scale, is notoriously expensive. You mentioned cost savings earlier. OpenFold 3. Ah, yes. The collaboration between Novo Nordisk, Columbia University, and AWS. They ran a massive training job using 256 GPUs. That sounds pricey. It would be, using standard on-demand cloud pricing. But they leaned heavily on AWS spot instances. Spot instances. Those are the spare compute capacity. Amazon sells off cheap, but they can pull the plug with almost no warning, right? That's the catch. Steep discounts, but potential volatility. They reported saving something like 85% compared to on-demand prices. And 85% saving is incredible. But how do you run a weeks-long AI training job on machines that could vanish any second? Seems risky. It requires very robust engineering. Their PyTorch setup had to be built for fault tolerance. Constant checkpointing, saving the model's progress frequently. So if a spot instance gets reclaimed? The system just grabs a new available one and resumes from the last checkpoint. It makes the volatility manageable. It's a smart way to stretch research budgets for these compute-hungry tasks. Very clever infrastructure work. Okay, so whether it's AFM or OpenFold, these models rely heavily on the transformer architecture. Correct. And transformers, especially the attention mechanism, have this inherent computational challenge. The scaling problem. Let's dig into that. What's the bottleneck? It really boils down to memory bandwidth. Standard attention needs to compute and, crucially, store the full attention matrix. Let's call it S. And if your input sequence has length n... That matrix S is m by n n squared. That's the quadratic scaling we always hear about. Double the protein length, quadruple the memory needed for that matrix. Precisely. And it's not just storing it. It's constantly reading and writing this 
potentially huge matrix to and from the GPU's high bandwidth memory, the HBM. Which is fast, but not infinitely fast, and certainly not as fast as the compute cores themselves. Exactly. The HBM becomes the bottleneck. The GPU spends more time waiting for data, input-output, or I.O., than actually doing calculations. Okay, so how do we fix that? Enter flash attention. Developed by researchers at Stanford, yeah. Flash attention is designed specifically to be I.O. aware, to minimize that HBM traffic. How does it manage that? Two main tricks, tiling and kernel fusion. Tiling means breaking the large input matrices, query, key, value, into smaller blocks or tiles. Okay. And kernel cousin means performing all the attention operations for a block. The matrix multiplies, the softmax, the dropout, within a single fused GPU kernel without writing intermediate results back to HPM. So the data for a block gets loaded into the GPU's really fast on-chip memory, the SRAM. Exactly. Static RAM much faster than HBM. And all the work happens there before writing the final output for that block back to HBM, much less back and forth. Grammatically less. Yeah. You minimize the slow HBM reads and writes. That handles the forward pass calculation, but for training, you need the backward pass for gradients. Don't you need that big N my N attention matrix S for that? But flash attention isn't storing it in HBM. Right, that's the second clever part. Recomputation. Instead of storing the huge matrix S, Flash attention stores just some small intermediate values derived during the forward pass. Okay. Then, during the backward pass, it quickly recomputes the necessary parts of the attention matrix S on the fly, again using the fast RAM. So it trades a bit more computation recalculating stuff for massively reduced memory traffic. Precisely. It turns out that doing a few extra calculations on fast RAM is much, much faster than constantly waiting to shuttle that giant matrix S back and forth to the slower HBM. And the impact is significant. Huge. In terms of I.O. complexity, the amount of HBM access standard attention scales like roughly theta N plus N2. Flash attention brings that down to something like theta N2 D2M, where M is the SRAM size. That division by M, the SRAM size, is the key, right? Makes the HBM access way lower. Massively lower. It leads to practical speedups, like up to 7.6x faster attention computation seen in tests like GPT-2. And maybe even more importantly, the memory usage scales linearly with sequence length M, not quadratically. So you can handle much longer sequences. Up to 64,000 tokens or residues, potentially. It's foundational for scaling these models, enabling things like OpenFold's large-scale training. Okay, pulling it all together, we've got AF Multimer, the highly optimized proprietary system, and OpenFold, the open-source, PyTorch-based consortium effort, both benefiting from low-level optimizations like flash attention. What's the bottom line for you, the listener? Well, if you need the current validated best-in-class performance for standard Multimer prediction right now, AlphaFold Multimer, with its proven 0.65 docu score and specific tweaks like unclamped FAPE, is likely your go-to. It's the established benchmark. But if you're looking towards the future or need more flexibility, then OpenFold offers that. It's built on PyTorch, permissively licensed, ideal if you want to customize the training, integrate your own data, or explore those cutting edge areas like Solosec or Ligon docking. It represents the open platform for innovation. So it's kind of a trade off between proven proprietary fidelity today versus open adaptable velocity for tomorrow. That sums it up pretty well. One gives you perhaps the best answer right now. The other gives you the tools to potentially find the next best answer. Maybe faster, maybe cheaper, maybe for a totally new problem. Which leads to a final thought. We see these incredibly efficient foundational tools like flash attention becoming open source. We see massive collaborative efforts like OpenFold 3 driving down costs. Yeah, the democratization is happening fast. So the provocative question is, Will this open source momentum, fueled by shared tools and collective resources, actually allow the open community to close the performance gap or even surpass proprietary systems, especially on those really complex new challenges like protein ligand interactions? That's the multi-billion dollar question, isn't it? Where will the next breakthrough come from? It's definitely something to keep a close eye on. Indeed, a fascinating space to watch. That's all the time we have for this deep dive.